Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope you're doing all right today. It's uh, fall back. At least it's sunny out. Um, we are doing a number of things today. First of all, we're going to remember those members and friends or family that have passed on this, this year, today, at, uh, during our service for All Saints Sunday. And... Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you to use the bullet insert at the time. I mean, the only thing you've you got to say is the amen at the end. Um, but, you know, you can follow along. And let's see, we've got gals. They are sponsoring a needy family for Christmas. If anyone wishes to donate toward that, please give funds to Nancy. Today, well, to, not today, but next Sunday. Uh, that, there's an erratum there. Uh, next Sunday, the 14th, is the last day for the Thanksgiving baskets uh, for bringing stuff in. So uh, if you could bring stuff in either today or next Sunday for that, then they'll get all that together for the Thanksgiving basket. Uh, November 13th, Men's Bible Study and uh, Work Day. November 14th, uh, Annual Meeting and all that good stuff after church. November 16th, I've got a pastor's conference, and on November 24th is our Thanksgiving Eve service. Those are the, the kind of dates to remember. We've got a bunch of uh, script uh, gift cards out in the narthex if you're interested. And I think that about does it for the announcements. We're going to look at what it means to be saints, to be holy. We're going to see what the scripture has to say regarding holiness today and, and how it, we can look at it in a, a proper fashion according to scripture and maybe not just uh, according to a little pop culture or what have you. So, uh, so that's kind of the theme today. And with that, uh, we'll begin with the opening hymn for all the saints, verses 1 through 4. Sins, 
Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins as the golden ordained servant of that same Christ. And by his authority I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. and defend us, gracious Lord.
Almighty and everlasting God, you knit together your faithful people of all times and places into one holy communion, the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that, together with them, we may come to the unspeakable joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The first reading for the Feast of All Saints is from Revelation to St. John, chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know... And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia and verse. According to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets 
who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 158. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being at one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A lot of times when we hear the word saint, especially when we hear it in a cross-cultural context, what we hear about is somebody who has attained a certain level of power a certain level of merit, a certain level of purity, they got the right stuff, basically. And they got enough extra right stuff that they can hand extra out to you and me, perhaps. That is the general take on saints that the Roman Catholic Church has. They have a special treasure chest, if you will, called the Treasury of the Saints, and the saints hand out their extra merits to help work against our demerits of sin. That's the way their system works. It's kind of like the government or some kind of accounting system where you have credits and debits. However, Scripture doesn't talk about saints like that. In some cases, saints in Eastern cultures are these extra powerful people that can kind of do things that we normal folks can't do. Uh, the Bible doesn't even talk about saints like that either. Actually, when you've got somebody who's doing something that is beyond the norm, that person is God. There aren't people that are doing super special, amazing, wondrous things. When people do miracles, they are doing it in the name of God. God is putting them into a place to do certain things, but they don't have inherent special abilities. Now, I'm not saying that the scripture passages that we read today about saints or holiness or that sort of thing are bad, far from it. But the fact that the doctrinal Dudley do rights of our denomination deigned to deliver these same three scripture verses in every year of the three year lectionary without looking at some of the other Bible verses involving holiness and saints, I find to be something of a shortcoming. We could at least have squeezed another year out of it, if, if not more. So I thought it would be helpful to go through what saints mean, what this idea of holiness means in Scripture. Things that are holy in the Old Testament are uh, kadosh. They, they, that's, that's the Hebrew word for holy. The Greek word for holy is hagios, or hagia, or hagion, depending upon the gender of the noun. And so we have, for example, the church called Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, which is now a mosque in Istanbul. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is, what the Bible says about saints are, it's, it's kind of a different kettle of fish than what the world wants to say. And I think this is important to know. And so, um, kind of went through and took a look at what Scripture has to say. And the first time 
that this holiness theme shows up is in Exodus 12.6. Uh, and the holy assembly are the people that are gathered for the start of Passover. What's very interesting is God calls his people holy. And then a lot of times what happens is after God calls his people holy, they start sinning. And it shows you that the saints are not these super special people with some extra mojo, but they are normal people like you and me. They make mistakes, they fall short of the glory of God, and, and God still calls them holy with respect to when they are gathered together with him to worship him. So there's something that is giving these people holiness that they don't have. That's what we see right away. The blood of the Lamb is covering God's holy people at Passover. The blood of the Lamb of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ covers us now. This is the first thing that gets established in Scripture regarding holiness. Then we go to Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6. The Lord called to Moses out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So we're, there we have this gospel promise of holiness, that out of all the peoples of the earth, God chooses to pick his people Israel. Now, what's interesting is first we have the gospel in Exodus 19, and then we have the law in Exodus 20. And here I'm going to read from Ferdinand Walter's uh, essay on thesis 6 of the proper distinction of law and gospel. Walter says, There was nothing pleasant, nothing comforting at Sinai. Even... The day before, Moses had announced to the people that God was going to come to them. And he did come with thunder and lightning. At early dawn, a terrible tempest sweeps up from the horizon. Finally, the mountain begins to quake, and the people are thrown into still greater fright when the mountain starts to tremble. The mountain turns into a majestic furnace. Flames shoot skyward, smoke, steam, and vapors rise up. Suddenly, a loud trumpet begins to blare, hurling its thunderclaps across the mountains and valleys, sounding like thunder. But the climax comes when the people hear the voice of Jehovah blaring the Ten Commandments at them with that rhythmic refrain, You shall! You shall! You shall! This concludes with... I am a strong, jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, etc. Everyone in the camp of Israel went to pieces from dread and fright. Now, of course, Walter is using the order of the commandments from Luther's small catechism, so it doesn't actually conclude with, I am a jealous God. That's part of the first commandment. But that authorial license aside, the fact is, before the Lord gives them the Ten Commandments. He pronounces his gospel on them. You are my own people. Here is the way you shall live. And of course, we, as we confessed at the beginning of the service, fall short of that glory. We fall short of those expectations. We fall short of those words. Nevertheless, what keeps God calling us his holy people? Because we see throughout the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, where we have the strongest motif of holiness in the Old Testament, that, quite frankly, the people of Israel are screwing up all over the place, and they are still considered holy. How is this possible? Because how can you mess up and be holy? It doesn't seem to go. There's got to be another principle involved. 
The principle of grace. The principle where God says, you are mine. This is what I expect. But if you fall short, my love through Christ's blood is going to cover your sins. Just like the blood covered the sins of the people's uh, Israel's sins in the Old Testament, Christ's blood covers our sins in the New. So throughout Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, holy things are related to worship. Priest vestments, for example, the altar, the Sabbath, Yahweh, God is the doer. His people are those who are responding to his doing. So if there is holiness to be had, it's because God is doing holiness to you, who is imparting holiness to you. He is making you holy. You are not making yourself holy. You are not climbing up the ladder to God. He is coming down to visit you because he loves you where you are at. So in Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 19, we have a number of points to be made. You have the statement, before they pay the tithe. A wandering Aramean was my father. Abraham, his children, were saved by grace. This is the first point. A wandering Aramean was my father. There was nothing special about Abraham when he was chosen. This Abram, who was chilling in Ur of the Chaldees, as it is written, he's hanging out in this ancient city from time immemorial, the place where the Sumerians and then the Babylonians were at, this fertile valley uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Why shouldn't he even stay there? But God called him out, and he takes flocks of sheep and wanders off, and not only goes up to the one end of the fertile crescent, but then comes back down to the land of Canaan. And there he sojourns, and even his son Jacob and his sons would go to Egypt when the famine hit the land. And of course, the second point in this passage is that God rescued his people from Egypt. Again, God does grace. He does grace by picking Abraham. He does grace by rescuing his people from Egypt. At this point, then, is when the people of Israel give the tithe. You see, God wants to show you how much he has paid for you, to get you, to have you. God wants to let you know that he has paid the cost of his own son, ultimately. Now, of course, before that, he has this entire salvation history that he has done things for his people, he has put out for his people, before they even had to do anything. What is this tithe really supposed to show? It's is supposed to show how light your purse is and how heavy God's bag of gold had to be. God purchased you with an innumerable price. Now that giving of the tithe, that is nothing. That is just light. That is barely a dent compared to what the Lord has done. You see what he's trying to do with the perspective there. Then... Uh, after being saved, declared God's holy people, they strive to follow the law. That's what they promise. Okay, now that we have been made God's holy people, now that we have been set right with God, now that we have been forgiven, what do we try to do? We strive to follow the law. There are so many Christians these days that want that forgiveness but don't want to follow the law. Scripture is clear. And Jesus himself says he has not come to abolish this but to fulfill it. If you have been forgiven by God, it is your job to try to follow the law and not take some cheap grace. Willful disobedience of the law in the Old Testament, even like, for example, the Sabbath regulations, is punishable by death. So it is, it is uh, truly something to see. God has established the covenant with his people, and Christ fulfills it, ultimately. But we are not, we are saints. We are not sort of forgiven just to roll around in the mud like a bunch of pigs. And so therefore, we should consider the prophetic statements of Jesus when he said that there are things that if you are the ringleader of, you face hellfire. Don't 
wallow in sin. Don't encourage others to wallow in sin. It will be bad. This has not changed. Christ himself says throughout Matthew that there are things that you can do that will earn you hell fire. Christ did not abrogate those on the cross. He fulfilled the law on the cross to allow you to be forgiven of all sorts of things except the sin of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, he has not stopped calling those things bad. And he has not stopped saying that there's something to be had, some condemnation, some punishment, whatever, some kind of judgment to be had for those who willfully set grace aside and choose to go their own way. Because that is the root of disobeying the law, is the rejection of grace. So, we have in Isaiah, we have three themes. Yahweh is holy as his temple, and as the place where he dwells, his holy mountain. This is quite clear in numerous passages in Isaiah. All those that he brings to that mountain also become holy. So, God's holiness is infectious, if you will. No hurt or destruction or death shall be there. And this is prophesied in Isaiah, but it is, quite frankly, made real, not only in Revelation, but at our own departure from this life. When we go to the Lord, everything becomes good. This, this has been known for eons. And this is why we welcome life with the Lord, both now and eternally. In Ezekiel, for the sake of his holiness, God will punish and bring low his people. For the sake of his holy people, however, he will not destroy them utterly, but he will restore a remnant. God will punish those whom he used to judge his people and bring them low if they likewise do not repent. So, for example, the Assyrians brought Israel, the ten northern tribes, low. God rescued Judah, but then Assyria faced judgment at the hands of Babylon. Babylon brought Judah low, and yet they did not repent, and in fact were, were very... Uh, blasphemous against God using the uh, materials that they got from the temple in a blasphemous manner and thus God brought the Babylonians low by means of the Persians. So the thing is just because God uses you to punish his people when they sin doesn't mean he lets you off the hook. There is never anybody that is let off the hook except for the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that lets us off the hook. That's the only thing that frees us from the punishments of the law. Daniel, Joel, Obadiah, and Zephaniah, and Zechariah repeat these same prophetic themes. So that's what you're understanding then when you're coming into the New Testament, period. That Yahweh is holy, that his temple is holy, and that his holy mountain is also holy. The place where God is, is holy. If God brings you in there, it's by grace, by faith, and through that he also lets you become holy. And there is no hurt, destruction, or death that can be there. Now, of course, when we disobey the law, what do we bring with that? Hurt, destruction, and death. So you see, there are two inimical principles at work here. Sin, on the one side, collides with the law and causes death. However, grace correlates with the law and brings life. And so, understanding that, we have 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, otherwise known as the ways of the world, the conventional wisdom, as everybody else does. But as he who called you is holy, you also should be holy. In all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And what that means is you have been forgiven. You have been offered grace. Do not wallow in the mud anymore. It's not worth it. Because ultimately, wallowing in the mud 
tears you away from that grace. It pulls you away from God. And you do not want to face God apart from grace. Because the law will condemn. The law will frighten. The law will toss you into an eternal furnace. So what, what is it that makes us holy then? Well, baptism. Washing of regeneration, the scriptures call it. It is forgiveness, it is salvation, it is new life. It's being joined with Christ. Baptism now saves you. So when we are joined with Christ, we are baptized into his death that we also might rise with him. It is important to be baptized. Those who are not baptized, they're doing the equivalent of spiritual playing in the traffic. You might last for a while, but you never know. So, uh, baptism is the thing, you know if the water got to your head and the words were with that water, you know where you stand with God. It doesn't mean that once saved, boldly saved, or anything like that, but it is an assurance that God has, in fact, pledged his love, his renewing grace to you. Absolution, your sins are declared to be forgiven by Christ himself. We did that at the beginning of the service, not just as sort of a blah, 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 okay, but it's a real thing. We can't move ahead with the service until we have been forgiven. That's why it's the first order of business. The Lord's Supper, receive the body and blood of Christ. And there you receive forgiveness. You receive power to embrace and obey that law that Christ has given you because he obeys the law perfectly and it's into him, into his body that you have been baptized, and it is his body that you receive to confirm that. So how can we want to sin, want to wallow in our sins when we have been washed clean and we have been fed by our Lord's body and blood? Now, of course, we cannot become perfect by ourselves in this life, but we become perfect in the sense that we have been joined with Christ, and he is perfect. And therefore, faith in Christ is a big deal. And uh, the whole point is not to cast him aside for the sake of evil. Why did David get together with Bathsheba? Because he had the root sin of not going out to fight on behalf of the Lord, which was what the kings were wont to do in the spring of the year, and instead he chose to lounge around Jerusalem, figuring that he could take it easy. And yet Bathsheba kind of put out the announcement, here I am. Women didn't bathe on their rooftops naked back in the day. Bathsheba had a plan. She was going to move up in the world, and of course David used her, and then he dumped her. And uh, then the whole episode with Uriah started going. So the fact is, when we sin, it starts off as something little. Nah, I don't think I'm going to chill with God today. Nah, God is a little bit of a pain today. It, it's just a little tiny thought, a little quirk, and all of a sudden it snowballs and it snowballs and it snowballs, and it gets way lots bigger and way lots hairier. And yet... David was forgiven. There were consequences, to be sure. There were many consequences. Not including the death of a child, the eventual disruption of the kingdom, and a lot of things that never needed to have happened. But they did. But still, the forgiveness was given. There was restoration, even if he was knocked down a peg or two. That's the way it is with us, too. You know, sometimes we do wrong things, and you got to pay for it. But God will still take you back. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. He is willing, wanting, and waiting to take you back when you stray. So it is through faith and not our works that we come to perfection in paradise. The vision of Isaiah and the other prophets is finally fulfilled. And here we have Revelation chapter 20 through 2, verses 1 through 5, which is the illustration we have on our bulletin covers, interestingly enough. I did not check to see that before the case. I, you know, this is independent. But uh, then the angel 
showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Now it's interesting, either side of the river, how, did, how does this work? We don't really know. But the tree of life here is literally the cross. Because the word used for tree in this sense, in the Greek, is the word used for a wooden implement, a xulon. Remember, a tree in Greek is a dendrion, because it looks like that. And uh, that's, that's uh, what things that are dendria look like. They're, they've got branches, and that's, that's, they're branchy. And so if, if, it were, if it was talking about a regular tree, it would be a dendrium, but it's not. It's a tsulon. It is a wooden implement. And what wooden implement do you know that Jesus is associated with? The cross. So this tree of life is the cross. It spans the river of life, and it yields 12 kinds of fruit each, each in its own month. And, of course, the 12 there is a symbolic for the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the same thing, the 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. They're associated with the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. So it is through being part of God's people, being his own, brought into this tradition of the prophets and the apostles before you, that you are saved, that you receive the fruits of forgiveness offered through the cross. And is by no mere consequence that that cross is associated with water, the water in which you were baptized, the river of life. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Ultimately, you are going to be healed not only of any moral imperfection, but also of physical imperfection. Christ promised you that you shall see him as he is that he shall give you an eternal body, a body that doesn't hurt, a body that doesn't break. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. So we're just practicing for eternity in church. They will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. And that's one of the reasons why we baptize, pouring water on the forehead. Night will be no more. There will be no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. That's ultimately where this goes, is eternal life. So being a saint isn't something like, well, you have to wait until you get there. You have to train real hard. You have to cultivate whatever chi you might have until you get to a certain level. It doesn't work like that. That's the way the world thinks about it. Saints are everyday Joes and Janes, just like Abraham, whom God picks out of the maelstrom of this fallen sinful world, forgives, baptizes, offers his body and blood to, he makes you his own. He creates the holiness in you. He declares you righteous and he gives you a life in his church now, and his glorious city to come. Now, of course, even the church now falls short of the glory of God, just like everything else in this world, but there is a better place in store for each and every one of us, and that's what we're hungrily looking forward to, because there will come a time in which the gospel will finally yield that perfection in life, where the law then will become the thing that we just do because the law is summed up in love and we will love God and we will love neighbor perfectly for all eternity. And God will have been loving on us the whole time. Just like in the Old Testament now, God loves on you a long time before you're motivated to love on him. Just like in the Old Testament, God promises you his, his life together with you. He is committed to you, just like a husband is committed to his wife. What a blessing that is. So we do not call ourselves hoity-toity powerful people when we call ourselves saints. Rather, we await the promise as regular Joes and Janes called out of this world, declared righteous by Christ, 
struggling through like everybody else, but finally knowing that when we depart this life, it will not be to something spooky or something strange or something Halloween-esque, but it will be to a home and a good place, a place where there is no death, no tears, nothing that is perverse or corrupt. Everything is good, and you get to enjoy God and one another for all eternity. May God see us all there one day. Marching in with that number as his saints. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds the one true faith in Christ Jesus. this time, if you want, you can look at the insert in the bulletin, and uh, uh, you can just kind of follow along and, and uh, just say the amen at the end. We pray for those remembering loved ones who have departed this veil of tears this year, including our members, Richard Barr, Shirley Michael, and friends and family, Dorothy Folgers, James Kimber, Pat Keibel, Marie Oliver. We also pray for those mourning the death of all saints who have departed this life here unnamed but known to the Lord and awaiting the resurrection. Heavenly Father, into whose keeping we entrust our loved ones, Help us to look to you in our time of sorrow, remembering the cloud of faithful witnesses with which you are surrounded. Grant that we may one day share in the joys of those who now rest in your presence. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the divine comfort for the family and friends of Pat who have... Uh, who, who has passed uh, from this world and who is awaiting the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all those who are in need of divine healing, those who are awaiting medical procedures, uh, some as soon as this week. We pray for those who are dealing with uh, chronic pain, uh, those who are struggling with cancer, those in assisted living facilities and nursing homes, those who are waiting for organ transplants, those who are dealing with dementia, those recovering from COVID, those who are struggling with various medical conditions and uh, recovering uh, as the case may be, or at least trying to deal with chronic issues. And we ask, Lord, that you be with them, that you remove the burdens that they bear, the pains that they have, if it be your good and gracious will. Otherwise, let it just be something where they can, they can deal with it. Be their companion each and every day. Be with them. Help them to know that you have called them, that they are special, that they are holy to you, and that you will continue to be with them and not forget them throughout the days of their life. Lord, in your mercy. We ask your divine guidance and protection for all who are in need of it, including our military, first responders, medical caregivers, those in authority, the families of those who are trying to protect and serve us and uh, help all who are in need uh, of making important decisions to listen to your Holy Spirit and not the evil ways of this world. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, for these and all other prayers, known only to you in our hearts, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. This time we begin with the service of the sacrament on page 160. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. 
Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, in the communion of all your saints gathered into one body of your Son, you have surrounded us with so great a cloud of witnesses that we, encouraged by their faith and strengthened by their faith fellowship, may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, and together with them receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, redo, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he gave it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you.